There we are. This is Damian Macy, representing the Friends of the Marshall Public Library for our oral history project. And today I'm at the library. It is Thursday, November the 5th of 2015, and I'm with Janet Haston. Janet is a longtime resident of the Marshall area, been very involved in school, library, and all. And with that, I think she'll probably have something to say and bring you up to date. So Janet, you're on. Okay. Um, like Damien said, my name is Janet Haston, but I was born Janet Ellen Clapp, C-L-A-P-P. -P. And um, the Ellen was after my great-grandmother, uh, Mary Ellen Eddington, and they lived in the New Goshen area of Indiana. That was my maternal great-grandmother. And um, I don't know where my mom got the Janet. I guess she just liked, she just liked that, I guess. Um, my Clapp ancestors have been, I am the fifth generation of them to live in Clark County. Um, Joel Clapp was the one that migrated here from Clark County, Indiana. And I'm not sure of the years, but when he came here, he settled out in the Clarksville area. And that's where um, the farm was. I wasn't born on the farm because my grandparents lived on the farm. But whenever I was born, I lived a mile south of them in uh, a house that was owned by Van Tarble. And my parents always referred to that as Van's place. But the house had been built by uh, George Hutchings, which is another of my ancestors um, on the Clapp side. And uh, so we lived in a house that had been built by an ancestor family, yeah. Um, I lived on what they call Dolson Prairie, and we still have the farm there today. And uh, we like to travel, but we always like to come home in Dolson Prairie and Clark County um, is just as pretty as any of the places that we've ever visited. I really like this place. Uh, my parents were Wayne D. Clapp and Leela Bell Eubank Clapp. And I have one sister, Angie Clapp Propes. And we were a very close family. Um, my dad was an only child, but my mom had nine brothers and sisters. So when we went to my grandma and grandpa Clapps, it was more quiet and sedate, and Angie and I were the focus of attention because we were the only grandkids. But when I went to my grandma and grandpa Eubanks, there were lots and lots of people <laughs> and lots and lots of grandkids. So um, the holiday celebrations were very different at my grandparents' houses, you know. And I think, Janet, most of those areas where you live <clears throat> are still some of the original families when you yes. were growing up are still there. Now. Yes, yes. Um, always went to Clarksville Baptist Church and um, the people that are there now are, and not all of them, but many of the people that are there now are from those original families that I grew up with going to church there. And, and um, most of the people at Clarksville are related to one another. If you go back far enough, you know how that goes. And, and that's just part of the the family of church too. We talk about a church family, but it really is a close knit group. Have you done any genealogy research to kind of document some of the family? Yes, um, and I, I always intend to do to do more. You know, yeah. when I have time, you know how that goes. But when my girls were in um, 4-H, they did citizenship projects, and we have traced the Clapp family goes back to Germany, and they've got documentation of where they came from and the ship that they came over and all of that kind of thing. And on the Rhine River, there was a Clapp Castle. And my parents have seen that. And my daughter Holly and her husband have seen it. Now, it's not a grand castle like you think of with Cinderella's Castle or whatever. But it was like the family home there on the Rhine. And when Holly and David, uh, our daughter and son-in-law, were there, they had turned it into a restaurant. And they were there, though, on a Monday when the restaurant was closed, so they didn't get to go in, but they did get to see it, you know, and all of that kind of thing. And my mother's family, the Ebank family, is from England, and they can trace their ancestry all, back, all the way back to the little town of Thirsk in England. And my mother and father have been there to that town, and they took um, their granddaughters, my two girls and 
Angie's girls to see it uh, on a family trip, but John and I have never been. Do you know how far back that was that they traced that? Um, John Eubank has been in America 200 years, and he's the one that migrated from England. And the claps, I think it was Johann or George, there were two brothers that came um, from Germany, and I think they spelled their name with the K, K-L-O, PP when they were in Germany, but they were the two brothers that came over here. And the Eubank family has a big reunion uh, every five years in southern Indiana where John and Ann Eubank built their stone house and their ancestors all come back. It's really quite cool. And the Clapp family has a big reunion in North Carolina. Wow. And they have it. Um, I think theirs is annually. Mom and Dad have been. John and I have never been to that. But it's, it's on our list of things to do. But that's where, uh, when the Clapp brothers came over from England, then they settled in North Carolina, and then they started branching out from there. Uh -huh. The stone house you mentioned in southern Indiana, is it by any chance still in the family? Yes. Yes, it is. And when we have that five-year reunion, they're kind enough to let us go in and... Um, see it and all that kind of thing. It's really very neat. And the nice, neat story about that and the, the Clapp family also, the Eubanks built a little church before they built their home. And Yes. And where the Clapp family has their reunion, it's the brick church, but that was built by Clapp family ancestors when they came over. So um, that faith that God is kind of a heritage that... Yeah. That's great. It is. <laughs> On both sides. Um, what else do I want to tell you? Uh, did you go to school in Clarksville? I did not. My mother taught in Clarksville for a, a few years, maybe a year or two, but I never went there. That school was closed by the time I went. But I do remember whenever I was little, and this is going to make me sound really, really old, <laughs> but the Clarksville Road was gravel. And I can remember the Clarksville Road being gravel. And whenever um, I was growing up, of course, Clarksville and where we lived is beyond Clarksville. Mm -hmm. But we were out there in the middle of nowhere and we still had the ring type phones. And uh, my grandma's ring was too long and ours was too short. And it was truly a party line. You know, you could hear the rings and people would, you could hear them lift up <laughs> so that they could get all the news, you know, and all that kind of thing. That was better than the internet? Yes. <laughs> the house that I lived in, that band's place that I referred to, didn't have indoor plumbing. And whenever I was in sixth grade, we moved down to Elsie Jane's place. Mars. Elsie Jane Mars's house, which was just south mm -hmm. of the BB Crossroads. And um, that was where we had indoor plumbing and we had... Um, a bathtub and you know all that kind of stuff but I remember whenever I was little um, mom would heat up water and, and Angie and I would get in this old metal tub and it was by the stove and that's where we'd have our have our baths on Saturday nights you know and we'd have sponge baths in between you know but that's what we did and after we had our baths then we would sit and um, She'd do our hair up in curlers to get ready for church on Sunday, and we'd have popcorn and Pepsi, and we'd watch Paladin, Have Gun, Will Travel, and Gunsmoke. That was our that, that was There our was tweets. a television then. Well, I, we got television whenever I was five. <laughs> but until then, we didn't have any television out there in the country, and it was black and white and, you know, all that kind of thing. Do you remember some of the games and things you played or... Youngster. We grew up, Van's place was just across the road from Jean and George Murphy's house. And I say just across the road, it was kind of kitty corner across the road. Um, but George and my dad had always been childhood friends because they had grown up um, close to one another. And uh, Jean and mom became friends. So we'd play with Tom and Brian and, you know, we they had a... Um, we had a big old lilac bush, and we there was a swing set there, and we'd play cars, you know, um, in the dirt under that lilac bush, and there was a woods back in the back behind, and we'd go back there, and we'd build um, cut down weeds and 
build places for houses and stuff like that. And then there was a barn that had, had uh, hay or straw in it, and we'd move those bales around and build forts and houses and all that kind of stuff. And, you know. Do you think, Janet, you had to use your imagination, imagination more yes, back then than yes. what kids do today? Yeah, we did. We did, but we had a good time. And we didn't play with Tom and Brian every day, but when we did, we'd have these big projects, and Angie and I always played together. Um, Mother, Angie, I'm three and a half years older than Angie, and when Mother was expecting Angie, she asked me if I wanted to have a baby sister to play with, and I said, sure, you know? Well, when Angie came, she wasn't much of a playmate. All she, all she did was cry. So I told mother to take her back. She wasn't, she didn't, I couldn't play with her. <laughs> I was expecting somebody that I could play with right away and that's not what I got. <laughs> but Were you disappointed if it would have been a boy? I don't know, never thought about it. Never thought about it. I'm really glad I have a sister. Yeah. I'm really glad, glad I have a sister. She and I, um, Foster and John say that Angie and I share one brain <laughs> because we just think alike. We answer each other's sentences and um, we just always know what the other one's thinking. Did you have some hobbies back then that make carry forward even to today? I loved reading. Loved, loved reading. Always loved reading. Um, but we were out of town, so I couldn't come to the library to check out books. Um, mother was a teacher, and so books were important to her, and we had a lot of, um, you know, little storybook type of things. But as I got older, I didn't have, oh, like Nancy Drew or those kinds of things to read, you know? Uh, I remember I read a set of encyclopedias that mom got once because I was just, I just loved reading. But they were like the child, it wasn't child craft, but it was... Was it Britannica? No, it wasn't Britannica, but, but I was so hungry to read that I just loved reading those. I always was needing a book in my hand. And of course, when we went to school, I could check out books from the school library, but during the summer, I didn't have anything to read. And I kind of think that's why I got involved with the library and the library board and all that kind of thing. And I was really happy that we passed the referendum so that the surrounding district, the donut district, you know, that unserved population outside of Marshall could have books and children could have books available to them because I just loved reading. Did you have a pet? Or I'm sure you had some duties around the house too. At that time. We had, um, <coughs> mother had chickens and we had to help gather eggs and clean eggs and all of that kind of thing. Um, we did have a dog, oh, always had a dog. We had cats. Um, most of the livestock and things like that were up at Grandma and Grandpa, so I didn't get involved in, you know, helping with that too much. But as I got older, um, Mom and Dad just had girls, so there weren't boys to help Dad on the farm. And he and Grandpa farmed together, so they didn't need a lot of help from um, me for a while. But I did um, drive the tractor. Dad never trusted me to plant or anything like that. He was always very particular about the rows and the way the rows would appear. They needed to be straight, you know. But I did disc quite a bit and I harrowed quite a bit. I did a little bit of field cultivating. Um, I drove um, hay wagons in and uh, used a John Deere 50 to pull the hay wagons in. And I was, it, this was way before I was 16, you know. And go down the go down the hill and cross the creek and back up the hill and that wagon was stacked with bales and it wiggle back and forth and I always was afraid I'd spill it but I never did. Was it always baled hay or did you have some of the loose hay? That All, what what I did was always baled, <coughs> and whenever I was a kid, it was always those we called them square bales. They were really rectangular bales. Um, as Dad got older, I think he put some up in the big round bales but they always did the square bales. And um, they'd have guys out in the field, of course, picking them up and stacking them on the wagon. And then they'd have guys back in the mow. And they, they unloaded it a couple of different ways. Um, one way was with the hiker, mm -hmm. you know, and they'd have the, the hiker set up um, and it would dump the bales off. Somebody would have to throw them on the hiker and then they'd dump off in the mow and then somebody'd go in there and stack them around. And then another way was they had this great big giant 
um, fork that they would lower down out of the mouth. Yeah, that's what it was. And then that would come down and it would bring up four, eight maybe, eight bales at a time. And then they'd jerk that back up and then they'd drop it in the mouth and those eight bales would fall down and then people would stack them around. So that was done then at actually your grandparents? At my home. grandparents. Mm -hmm. Did they have a lot of livestock that used those, that hay? They had, they always had cattle. Dad loved okay. Hereford cattle, okay? <clears throat> okay? That was his kind that he liked the best. And they had hogs. They farmed with horses when Dad was little, but I never really remember them farming with horses. They always had, um, they always had tractors whenever I, when I remember it. I remember them butchering a hog one time, and I was really little, but the picture that I have in my mind is the hog hanging by its hind legs, you know? And I remember a big, I can, it was split open, I can still see that, and they had a big kettle there where they were melting down the lard and the fire under that, um, but most of the time they took it to the locker, and usually it was Edgar County Locker was where they took it. That butchering then, was a lot of the neighbors helping and involved in that too, or was it just family? I think it was just family, but um, because there was grandma and grandpa that lived there, but up the road was grandpa's brother, Uncle Homer and Aunt Beulah. And I think he had come down to help with that. And then dad and mom and grandma and grandpa, I think it was just family that was there that day. Did your mother make sausage? Um, that time they did, but generally then it was all just done at the, at the plant. But there was nothing that tasted as good as fresh tenderloin. Oh, right after it had been butchered and mom would fry that for breakfast and make gravy and oh my gosh, it, there's nothing that you can taste today that compares with that. Did your mother ever can meat? No, I don't remember her doing that. We canned a lot. Um, but that was mostly vegetables. We, she always raised chickens. Um, she had chickens for eggs, but she would get chickens um, to kill in the summer to dress out, and I got to help with that. <laughs> um, I can re I never, I never killed them. I watched Grandma and Grandpa kill them, and Mom would kill them, but I never, I never did that. Um, and they would flop, you know, and it would, I swear they would chase you around the yard, you know. <sighs> Not one of the more pleasant memories, gotcha. but anyway. Um, and then you had to dip them in that hot water and pick all the feathers. Yes, they smell so bad. Um, pick all the feathers off and then you had to singe the hairs off and all that kind of thing. <laughs> but we did that That's lots and lots of times. <clears throat> part of the childhood memories though. Lots and lots of times and I can still, we usually did that at grandma's. Sometimes we'd do it at our house, but usually it was up at grandma's and they had, it was in her backyard under a big oak tree, you know, and they had tables set up there and I, I remember you had to be real careful not to cut into the part that had the bile or it would spoil everything and you know, the dogs would carry off the chicken's feet sometimes and chew on those. I mean, <laughs> oh. Grandma always had chickens, too. Both Not of them exactly did. something you'd care to repeat today, right? No, no. I remember um, when we were little because mother taught for a little while after I was born. Um, I think that's when she taught at Clarksville. And Grandma and Grandpa kept me. But after she had Angie, she didn't teach again until, I think it was when I was in sixth grade that she started teaching at North Center. Um, but in between that time, to make money, then that's when she had eggs. And I remember that Sam and Lenny would come and pick the eggs up on I don't remember what day they would come, maybe in the middle of the week. But we'd have to have the eggs all clean, and Mom had this little scale thing where you had to weigh them, whether they were large or um, medium or small. And we had these big cartons that you had to stack them in, and they had those little sander things that, that looked like an eraser kind of, but they had mm -hmm. sandpaper on it. And you had to clean the eggs. I had to help do that whenever I was a kid. I'll bet you never broke one either, did you? Not very often, not very often. I was pretty careful. Mom had a ringer washer, 
back in the day, and I got my arm stuck in the, in the ringer one time. But that was no big deal. It just kind of scared me. Now, at that particular time, you had electricity also, right? Mm -hmm. I always, we always had electricity as long as I remember. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't until we moved to Elsie Jane's, though, when I was in sixth grade, that we had the dial phone. We had that ring mm -hmm. phone until then. Um, I don't know, I guess you'd call this a chore. Um, but I, I did the stuff with the tractor. And then I uh, hauled grain to the elevator. And this was way, maybe I was 14, maybe 13 or 14 when I did that. And driving the grain truck up to the combine whenever um, Dad was ready to unload. I did all of that. Um, but that was a clutch, you know, um, truck. And it was heavy, full of grain. And then when you got to the elevator, you were on this incline thing. I mean, I think about what I did and how I did that, but I hauled to Redmond, I hauled to Ashmore, I hauled to Westfield, Kansas. Never went to Marshall. But those were all kind of back, back road kind of things, but shifted that. I can drive a stick today because I, <laughs> because I learned, on, learned on that. In the area that you lived in, it was obviously Clarksville, was the metropolitan area That's at that right. time. Uh, what do you remember about, there were some businesses and all at that time? What, what do you remember about Clarksville? Um, I remember Emil Fox's store. And we really didn't shop there that much, but I remember going there. He, Emil had bologna that my dad liked. <laughs> and sometimes we would stop there and get the bologna and you know, they'd slice it for you and they'd put it in the white paper and tie it up with string. Um, and then on down the street was Riley Baker's store. And I remember that. Um, And I remember, right? I think Riley Baker's store was op open longer than what Emil and Ruth Fox's was, I believe. Um, because I remember having to stop on the bus and pick people up at Riley Baker's store. And Riley would come out. He was kind of a different kind of guy. Um, now, Catherine Finley told me, I don't remember this, but Catherine Finley told me they used to have movies in Clarksville and they would project it on the side of Riley Baker's store. But I don't remember that. Was those more of a general store as yes. opposed to just a grocery? Yeah. And like I said, I really don't remember going in them that much. When we went to the doctor, we went to, to Kansas to the doctor, to Dr. Mm -hmm. Weaver, and um, as a treat on the way home, we'd come home uh, through Grandview, and we would stop at Polly and Mary Finley's store in Grandview, and Mom would let us get ice cream because we'd had to go to the doctor. And Polly was a man, okay? That was, and I don't know what his real name was, whether it was Paul, but Polly, Polly. was the man, and Mary was his wife, and they ran that store. And he had a bald head, he kind of looked like Dopey the Dwarf was who he kind of reminded me of because he totally bald, kind of big lips. But whenever Angie and I would walk, would walk in, he'd, he'd always say, well, hi, boys, how are you? And I, that just tickled me because I wasn't a boy, but Polly always <laughs> called, called Angie and I boys, you know. But that was a big treat to get to go there. General shopping then, what uh, town or where did you go for your... Shopping. That's very different than today because we went to Marshall once a week, okay? And we went on Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. And usually after work on Saturday nights and the stores were all open, the grocery store that we went to was where the library is today. Kroger? Kroger, mm-hmm. Um, and I remember that they had peanuts in a barrel, you know? Yeah by the door and you could just scoop out peanuts. But there was also Bow Singers is where you could get dry goods and there was uh, Will Fonds where you could get, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's where this is, uh, dresses and things like that. There was a, was Bow Singers down the street? Didn't they have material and stuff like that? I believe so. Um, 
I remember that Harry and Mabel Murphy, which were neighbors out there, would usually come to town earlier than we did because Harry wanted to get the parking spot right at 6th and Archer, right there by Grab and Hammer's store, yeah. facing south. And he would sit there and he would lean against his car and talk to everybody that went by, but that was kind of the prime spot. And um, Probably knew everyone. Too. Yeah, knew everybody. But Saturday nights, Marshall was busy. Lots and lots of people shopping and the stores were all open and all that kind of stuff then. Um, if we didn't go to Marshall, Marshall was where we did our grocery shopping and just general things like that. Mom ordered a lot of things through the catalog. Yeah. Uh, Sears catalog, Ward's, Pennies. But um, I don't really remember those being delivered to the house. I guess they must have been. But a lot of times we'd go to Paris then and pick them up in Paris um, because Paris had a Wards and a Sears and a Pennies. Sure. Um, we, ne we went to Terre Haute maybe three times a year, maybe, to get school clothes around Christmas and around Easter. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was, it was a big deal. Sure. Big deal to go As to As I recall, Terre Haute. parking and all on those Christmas shopping trips was just a mob. Uh -huh. You didn't know where you could find a place to park, uh -huh. maybe several blocks away. And mother generally didn't take us. A lot of times it was grandma and grandpa Clapp that would take us. Um, grandma had a brother that lived in Terre Haute. Ooh. And I don't know whether mother didn't really feel comfortable driving in Terre Haute, but I remember grandma and grandpa taking us more than I do mom. There have been a bus still running through here yeah. to Terre Haute. Did you ever take it? I never did that. I never did that. Um, some of my friends, I remember them talking about doing it, but I was too much of a country girl. I didn't, you know, that would have been a trip to, to come in town to get on the bus, you know what I mean? Living in the country and coming into Marshall, it did seem like a big place. And do you remember some of the stores? You mentioned a couple or mm -hmm. some of them here. Those are the ones I remember. Um, Blankenship's Drugstore, mm -hmm. uh, Western Auto, the, oh, the Dime Store, you can't forget the Dime Store. That was a wonderful place to shop. And Mr. Caldwell was always so friendly. You know, he was just kind. Um, now, I think mom and dad got their prescriptions at Blankenships, I believe. But Paul Martin's drugstore was an important place to me because when I got to be in high school, if I had any kind of activities after school, well, I had to wait around town until somebody could pick me up. And Paul Martin had uh, a soda fountain at his drugstore. And he also, he was so kind, and he must have been uh, thoughtful of us country kids or something, because in the front of his store there was a telephone. Mm -hmm. And you could just walk up there and I would call and let my dad know that I was ready to be picked up. And there wasn't a charge for that or anything. You know, he just, he just let you call. And then, um, what was that lady's name? Bernice? Wasn't it Bernice? Oh, I can see her face. But she worked behind the soda fountain. I can't think of her name. Oh, she had kids that were in school a little older than me. But I'm pretty sure her name was Bernice. She was a small lady. But she, she's the one I remember working behind the soda fountain. But I'd order me a cherry Coke or something like that and sit there and wait on Dad uh, to come and pick me up. And he'd pull out front and I'd kind of watch for him. And then he would, he would come. And I, usually the activities after school involved band or GAA because they didn't have girls' sports back in the day. This is when you were in high school? This is when I was in high school. So what about the school bus? Well, this was, I had to stay after for some of these activities. Generally, okay. I, I rode the okay. school bus home. But if the activities were after school, um, then Dad would come pick me up. But generally, I rode the school bus home. And uh, Roy Pruitt was a bus driver. Uh, Dean Spittler was a bus driver. Mo Hardway was a bus driver. Mo Hardway got in a fight one time with one of the high school boys. Mo wasn't a very big guy. And I, I remember I was scared because the high school boy was big and Mo wasn't very big. And I don't think it really escalated to physical blows, but I thought it was going to. Pretty close. Yeah, huh? pretty close. <laughs> um, and we lived way out, so generally we were one of the last ones off. And uh, 
on the road where Tom Murphy lives now, I don't know the, the number, but on that road, um, there were two places where there were Fords in the creek, you know, just concrete at the bottom. And if you sat in the back and Dean Spittler went over the, the Ford just right, you'd fly up in the air. <laughs> that was a big deal. Right off the ceiling. <laughs> off the ceiling. That was a big deal. We tried to do that about every day. <laughs> that was our entertainment. <laughs> In those, uh, those school days and going to and from and all, did you ever go up to Westfield for shopping or anything there since you were coming no. out in that general? No, we no. didn't go to Westfield. Now, I do remember mother graduated from Westfield High School, mm -hmm. and I remember going to Westfield in the summer. They'd have a homecoming there, and they also showed some movies in Westfield there at the park. They'd put up a big sheet, mm -hmm. and they would show movies there and I remember being there for those kinds of things but generally we just came to Marshall and didn't go to Martinsville too often um, after Dr. Weaver um, retired then we went to the doctor in Martinsville Dr. Moore went down there to him and mother taught for Martinsville schools but she taught at North Center which was really closer to our house it was only like three miles or something from our house, and we went all the way into Marshall for us for 10. She took my mother's place when my mother retired. Uh-huh, And uh -huh. I had kind of forgotten that until I was talking to your mother. Uh-huh. With those early memories and all, did there, uh, was there a particular thought in your mind that, well, someday I might want to be a teacher? I loved helping mother with um, bulletin boards, grading papers, um, organizing, you know, all that kind of stuff. She would let us grade some of her papers at home and, and things like that. Um, I remember the community meetings that they had at North Center. That was such fun. They had those every month. And um, even though I didn't go to school at Martinsville, I was in 4-H with some of the kids that went to North Center School. So I knew uh, several of the kids that went there and all of that kind of thing. And that, that little school would be packed, Busy. packed on that Friday night that they had community meetings and the kids would put on plays and they'd have cakewalks and um, it was just a great time. Did you ever go to any of their pie suppers? Yes, yes. I, you know, it was, it was a wonderful time. Um, that was probably our biggest social activity outside of church. And I haven't even talked about church yet, but. I'll just go back to that thing of community. Don't, or maybe you feel differently, but that was a true part of the community spirit, I think, of people joining together, participating. It just doesn't happen anymore. No, it, it doesn't. And um, you went back to imagination, you know, and play and stuff like that. Um, people had a good time just visiting and just doing simple things like those, those cakewalks or enjoying the kids the, the plays and things that they put on. There'd be some special thing that was every every month, you know, but it wasn't a big deal, no. you know? It wasn't a big deal. And we look back now and say, that might have been a little on the corny side, but hey, that was a part of the It evening. was part of it. And people visited and they cared about their neighbors and they caught up with mm -hmm. people and I don't know, it, it, it just was a special time. It was a different atmosphere and a different condition. Yes. Than it, it is it, today. Yeah. It was. So what year did you graduate from Marshall High School? I graduated in 1970. Okay. And it was a big deal when I got my license because then I could drive back and forth and my dad didn't have to come and pick me up anymore so that he appreciated that. Did you have your own car? I did. Well, it was an old beater. Um, I, I don't remember the first one I had. I remember... Um, there was a 57 Ford that I drove, and that may have been the first one. And then there was a 69 Plymouth that oh. I drove most, that I drove most of the time. I think, maybe it was a 65, it was blue. A 65, it wouldn't have been 69, that was too new. But I drove that most of the time. But. And at that time, was it a relief not to drive the bus? Or was it just more convenience with the car and the activities you had? I don't remember it being that much of a relief because I always kind of enjoyed the bus. You know, it was, um, 
kids that you knew, you know, your friends and your neighbors, and you'd catch up on what had gone on at school all day with them, but it was way more convenient to drive, you know, back and forth. And we had band practices a lot on Thursday night before games on Friday mm -hmm. out on the football field, you know, and everybody would go and we'd do different formations and move around and all that kind of stuff. And What instrument did you play? Alto sax. And then in stage band, I played tenor sax. So. Do you still have the fingering in mind and all? If you, you said know, that one, you could play it? I don't. And I, I got it out. Heather played the alto sax as well. And I've often thought that I may get out someday and play in the city band, but I'd have to relearn. I'd have to relearn. That's going to be my next question. Yeah. Have you thought of that? I'd have to relearn all that fingering. I played in the city band early, um, probably whenever I was in high school after I could drive, college maybe. I don't remember exactly the years, but I played in it earlier. Did you have a favorite subject or a favorite class in school? Anything that involved reading, I liked. <laughs> um, I liked social studies a lot whenever I was a kid because I always enjoyed learning about other countries and other places. And we did some of that in church as well. Um, Clarksville Church was a really, really important part of our life and we were there Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evenings. Um, but we had something called uh, GAs, Girls in Action. It was a, a girls organization where you learned about missions and things like that. But I always really liked that because they would talk about missionaries and the other, the places where they served and learning about the culture and the way they did things differently and, and all of that kind of thing. I always enjoyed that. We didn't take very many, very many vacations as a kid because my dad farmed. So, you know, when we could go in the summer because of school, he couldn't go because of, of farming duties. But we visited my aunts and uncles a lot on my mom's side, but that was mostly all over Illinois. Um, Golconda, Metropolis, Murfreesboro, Carthage, Carmi, that was all my... Um, Interesting places. Well, that was all Tanny and Evan Lichen. He worked for the Soil Conservation Service, so he moved around different places. We went there with them, and Cape Girardeau was where my um, Uncle Wayne and Aunt Linda lived. We went there. Murfreesboro, Tanny and Evan lived there for a while and visited them. During those, uh, those summers, what did you spend your time doing when you were out of school? Reading. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Reading and helping with the garden and doing the chickens, you know, um, dressing chickens out and um, mowing the yard, you know, just things around the house. Um, but we didn't. We played, um, after we moved down to Elsie Jane's, and we got too big for Brian and Tom, you know. Um, they had boy things they wanted to do. We had girl, they didn't want to do our girl things anymore. We played with Beth Lycan a lot. Beth uh, Lycan lived over across the field, and we'd ride bikes over to Beth's house. She was a cousin, as well as a neighbor. And in coming back to the high school and all, and, and your church, um, did you spend a lot of, say, Wednesday evenings or church services? Did any of those conflict with school activities? No, no, no. They didn't have any activities for the school on Sunday or on uh, Wednesday back in that day, back in that day. One of the things that I remember about Clarksville Church, um, the old church I'm talking now, the, the brown brick church, on Sunday evenings, it didn't have air conditioning. So they'd have the windows open and um, the whippoorwills would call um, in the woods there that are east of the church. And that was just always such a sweet, sweet sound. Did they have the cardboard fans? Yep. And most of them had Mars Funeral Home mm -hmm. <laughs> on the back of them, you know, advertisements from there. Clarksville people usually um, frequented Benny. Mars's funeral home because he was a Clarksville person, you know. Um, the Elsie Jane that you mentioned was his sister. That's right. That's right. But that's yeah. usually where, when somebody passed away at Clarksville, they usually went to the Mars funeral home rather than the Moore funeral home. Um, there was something else I was going to say about church, but I can't remember right now. Oh, uh, another big deal at church. My parents' Sunday school class was called the Willing Workers. Sunday school class. 
and they had a get together i think it was the third friday of every month and their sunday school class would get together and sometimes it was at homes but usually it was at the church and so they would have their get together they'd have a little devotional and then they'd have always involve food you know <laughs> down in the basement and so us kids were just free to roam and play while they were having their meeting and then we could all go down and eat and um, usually we were upstairs back in the Sunday school rooms sometimes we'd go in the sanctuary but if if my mom if my dad heard us running upstairs in the sanctuary we were in big big trouble but I remember um, playing outside we go play out in the graveyard and play hide-and-seek behind behind the tombstones you know and all that kind of stuff and um, get ourselves all scared out there in the the yeah, tombstones about. you know all that kind of thing and come running screaming back but we just had had a really good time uh, there was a mausoleum um, back behind in the cemetery yeah. and uh, there were steps where you could climb up. You could go around and go up the hill, but it was much more fun to climb up the steps that weren't really steps. They were how it was built, where the retaining wall was, but you would climb up that to get to the top of it and stand there and look over the side. And some of the more adventurous boys would jump off of the mausoleum down onto the concrete below. You never tried it? I never, I don't think I ever jumped, <laughs> but I was there when some of the others did. With, and I always thought that church was very attractive. It looked just like the typical country church. Mm -hmm. Did you have a kind of a sentimental of attachment or sad to see it go? I was sad to see it go. Um, we looked at different ways to add on to it. Um, and we tried really hard to figure out a way to add on to it um, instead of building a new church. But our problem was that we were kind of landlocked with the cemetery around it yeah. and if we would have added on then it would have taken a lot of our parking spaces um, back behind you know so we were just kind of kind of stuck and, and decided to go ahead and build a new one and we decided to go ahead and tear it down um, rather than sell it because when you sell it you lose control of it and you don't know right in the midst of everything else and you don't know what they're going to use that building for and to us that was a sacred place and we didn't want it used for anything but but a church and something holy so we decided to go ahead and just tear it down and then we would have control of how it was used and all that kind of thing. We do have plans. Um, we've got some of the brick from it and we want to build um, a little memorial there where the old church was. I was going to ask, is there something planned for that, that spot? Yeah. So you've answered that. And uh, to put a, a memorial there with the old brick and um, nice. some benches where people can sit and reflect. Kind of a memorial garden type of thing. Yeah. That's great. I know, well, you mentioned saxophone, but I think you also do piano. Yes. Keyboard work. Yeah. Uh, I think you've been involved in the church with that, haven't you? Yes, and my piano teacher, my first piano teacher was Becky Carr, who was a, a Clarksville gal. She was um, Bob and Josephine Carr's oh. oldest daughter, and she started teaching me piano whenever I was about five years old. And then um, Becky got married and she had babies of her own that she needed to take care of. And so then I started taking piano from Nina Hogue, mm -hmm. who was the pianist there at Clarksville. And um, came in town to, to Nina's house for um, piano lessons. And if we did really well on a piece, sometimes she'd give us a dime, you know, as a reward. And we'd have recitals at Clarksville Church. Um, and I've got pieces to this day that have, that Nina gave me. Um, and still has her handwriting on them, you know. Did she ever put a gold star on too when you finished a certain accomplishment? 
you know, I don't remember her doing much with gold stars. I remember the dimes if I did really well. <laughs> if I did really well. Uh, but there are certain, we just had homecoming at church, um, our 90th homecoming on October 20, uh, 25th this year. Um, the church was built in 1857, the first church, but we haven't had homecomings as long as the church has been in existence. But whenever I played the offertory for homecoming, I played one of Nina's favorites. What was it? Finlandia. Oh, yes. She always liked that and played that a lot, so. Now, you have a piano and an organ both? We have a piano and then... Um, Clavinova? Clavinova. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I play the piano and then Carol Lichen, who's really my aunt, I referred to her a while ago as Tanny. Uh, that's my mom's, one of my mom's sisters. She yep. plays the Clavinova most of the time. And if she doesn't do it, then Melinda Spires plays the Clavinova. Do you spend a lot of time with music at home? I, I like to play. I played the piano this morning. I was getting ready for, um, we're doing a choir special at church on Sunday for Veterans Day, and we're, gonna, we're going to sing God Bless America. So I was practicing on that. And my newest son-in-law is uh, a former Marine. So I got the Marine hymn, and I'm going to play that, <laughs> play that for him on Sunday because he requested that I do that. A lot of times I'll play the Navy hymn, not Anchors Away, but the Eternal Father Strong to Save. Uh, we have a lot of Navy veterans in our church, so I'll usually play that for offertory for them on Veterans Day or Memorial Day. But as people are leaving for the postlude, I'm going to play from the halls of Montezuma the Marine hymn for Brian. And our new minister is an ex or a former Marine as well. They say you're never an ex Marine. You're uh, you're always. always a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. You're well, just I've a always former. found music, as you know, such a wonderful hobby and mm -hmm. just a way to relax too. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. getting involved in so many other things, I don't practice as much mm -hmm. as I used to. It's a, it's a way I feel close to God whenever I play. Yeah. And after a busy day, sometimes it's a good way to clear the uh -huh. cobwebs uh -huh. and get rid of frustrations mm -hmm. too sometimes. Mm -hmm. With the high school and all, and uh, you graduated from that, up, obviously, you said in 1970. Mm -hmm. What was that next step? Next step was college after that. And, and um, I said I didn't go to Martinsville very much growing up, but I went there quite a bit in uh, 1967 and 1968 because I was dating a young man from Martinsville. Um, Dick Mattis was his name. And he was probably, he wasn't my first boyfriend, but he was my first serious boyfriend. <laughs> and then in 1968, he graduated from Martinsville High School and went to college at Eastern Illinois University. And we, we dated for a little bit after he went to school, but that's kind of hard, you know? Focus has changed. He was, I was just a junior in high school and he was off onto different things, you know, more important things. And, and we just grew apart, so I, uh, we broke up, and I started dating a young man named John Haston. In How did you happen to meet him? 1968. He and I were classmates because he graduated in uh, 1970 as well, but I really didn't know John until junior high because back in the day, there were North School kids and South School okay. kids. And uh, North School was the city kids, and South School was the country kids. And I did go to North School for third and fourth grade and met some um, really nice people, Marjan Schaller, Sheila Schaffner, yeah. Camille Stallings, all those, Ann Garwood, all those people were in my class um, at North School. But John was in the other grades. I had Mrs. Buckner and Mrs. Baker, and John had Miss Kuhn and Mrs. Curran, so we never met in grade school. But in junior high, um, we had the same homeroom. We had Miss Bubeck's homeroom, and we sat, he was sat in front of me, and I don't know whether we were assigned those seats or what, but we played tic-tac-toe <laughs> during seventh grade activity period. 
And uh, that's when I first met him, and we just became friends then, but we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. We were, we were friends. Um, but just kind of kept up that relationship, and then in jun when we were juniors, then that relationship kind of bloomed into something else. And we have been a couple ever since our junior year in high school. And um, you asked earlier about being a teacher. My mom was a big influence in being a teacher because I loved helping her with things. Um, and we didn't have all the career choices back then that we, the kids do now. Uh, girls back in the day were either, they either got married right out of school and became housewives and mothers or they became teachers, nurses, or secretaries. And um, I really enjoyed all my all my classes in Marshall High School, I liked them a lot, but um, I probably enjoyed my business classes the most. And one of the people that influenced me to be a teacher was Marilyn Smitley. And I had her um, for business. And she was a young lady at that time when she was um, teaching me. And I, she always looked so pretty and so put together and, <laughs> you know, uh, super organized, but I just never ever saw her be ruffled or anything, you know. I just really admired Mrs. Smitley. So whenever I was trying to decide what to do, uh, John and I thought we'd just get married right out of high school uh, because a lot of people, a lot of our classmates were doing that. And my mom wanted, uh, my sister and I both, she always encouraged us to go on to college. She wanted us to be able to support ourselves in case something happened, you know. Um, and I give my mom a lot of credit for that. My mom was the first one in her family to go to school. And um, she showed her older brother, Richard, the way to go. He had gotten out of school and had gotten a job, I'm not for sure where here in Marshall, but he told me that it, my mom was the reason that he went on to college because she showed him that it could be done you know, and all that. So mother wanted Angie and I both to go on to school. And my dad said, you and John just go right ahead and get married. But if you go on to school, I'll pay for it. Okay. And being the good, being the good business person that I was, I thought I can wait four years. <laughs> and I was the, it was the wisest thing. You know, nobody's really ready to get married out of high school. I mean, I suppose they were, but I, I really wasn't nearly as ready as what I thought I was. So that year of graduation then, after summer, you registered for? Eastern. Eastern? Mm -hmm. Went to Eastern Illinois University. I never stayed in a dorm um, oh. up there. John did, um, but I stayed in a private home. I stayed um, in the basement of Carl and Mary Lou Sexton's house. And Carl was Mary Catherine Williams's brother. Oh. And so he he was a professor at Eastern, I think, in the health department. And he and his wife had created an apartment downstairs, and they just rented it out to students. To, to students. And um, I was good friends with Linda Williams in high school. She and I were cheerleaders together okay. our senior year. And um, she was going to Eastern as well, so she told me about the apartment at Carl and Mary Lou's. And so I stayed... Um, down there with Linda and her sister Beth and Amy Finkbeiner Ladd oh, yeah. and uh, myself were roommates that first semester down there. And uh, anyway, I just, I lived there for three years and then the last year, my senior year, we student taught, John and I both student taught at Paris. Oh. And so we lived at home then and just drove to Paris, and then that last um, semester, we just drove back and forth. Um, and what were you majoring in at that time? Majored in business education, thanks to Marilyn Smitley. <laughs> I liked teaching and I liked business, the secretarial kinds of things. One thing, too, that I think really helped in my decision making, I saw my mom and what it was like to be a teacher, but back at the high school then, they had all these. Uh, different activities that you could be a part of. They had future teachers, they had future nurses, uh, there was the business clubs, you know, things like that where you could get a taste of what some of those um, 
activities were going to be like. And I was one of the future nurses and, and was a candy striper over at Burnside. And we had to wear the little uniforms, you know, that were the red and white uh, striped. And my another one of my good friends, Leslie Douglas, was um, a candy striper too. And Leslie wanted to be a nurse. And she wanted me to go with her to nursing school. She was enrolled at Danville and wanted me to be her roommate and go there with her. But after that experience with the candy stripers, I just knew that was not, that was not for me, you know? That, that was not my calling. That experience was probably a good one. Because it was. Sometimes people get into things that they're really not exactly. happy with or qualified for. Either. Exactly. <laughs> and as much as I loved Leslie and wanted to go on with her and be her roommate, I just knew I couldn't do, I just couldn't do those things. But I think that's really good that, that we had those experiences to kind of solidify our thinking of what we wanted to do. So mother was a great school teacher, mm -hmm. but here you're working on business education. So you decided right then apparently you'd rather teach in high school or advanced rather than grade school. And you know, another thing that helped with that, Marilyn Smitley was a big influence, but also my dad was uh, a member of the Clark County Soil and Water Conservation Board. And I had the opportunity um, during college, but also I think between my junior and senior year and senior year and, and college to work part-time as a secretary down there in uh, the soil conservation office. And that that opened my eyes to, yeah. I really enjoyed that kind of work and, and that kind of thing as well. I painted soil maps. They were doing the, the mapping of the county with, um, I guess they got the maps through satellites, I guess. But then I had to go through and color in the different soil types and they put that in all the cooperators folders so you could pull out that soil map and they could see the different mm -hmm. soil types on their farm and know you know, what type might need more fertilizer and what type might be more productive and all that kind of thing. They're probably still doing that, but I imagine a computer does that. Today, probably, <laughs> but I can still I, I can still sit there and see a lot of those, nap, those maps and I know a lot of farmer names from across the county because I've probably painted their soil map, you know, but that was a good experience. Business in that particular period of time and today, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you took and maybe even have taught a thing called shorthand. Yes. Uh, and so many of those things, now I don't think they even call it typing, but keyboarding or keyboarding, something. Keyboarding, yes. Um, what has been your reaction to the change in the business education? Well, technology has driven a lot of that. You know, um, one of the things that makes me sad is that we have lost our attention to detail. You know, people write letters now and the grammar is, is bad, the form is bad. Um, they just don't take as much pride in making things top notch. Uh, and that was something that was always important to me. I was always kind of a perfectionist and I just wanted things to be exactly right. I wanted to create that good impression. I wanted um, things that I was a part of to be thought of, mm -hmm. you know, as high quality and all of that kind of thing. I don't know. Not, not so. I guess I, you're talking about the quality and everything here, some schools last year, I don't know if they've changed their channels or not, not even teaching cursive writing. Right. To me, that is just totally appalling. Right. Because that signature is who you are. Yeah. That's your identity. That's how you can, can um, they can be sure that you're the one that signed that contract. You know? I don't know. So do you think education is on the, quote, right track, or is it going a little bit off the track? I think education is going off the track when they try to put everybody in the same mold. Not every student belongs in a four-year school. And that doesn't mean that not, I believe every student is talented in some way, but it's not always academically. Right. There's, there's musical talent, there's creative, you know, fine art type of talent. Uh, there's athletic talent, and then there's academic talent. There's also people that can build wonderful things and, you know, with their hands, create things. Mechanics. We need mechanics. Yes. And I think education, when they try to put everybody in a mold and say they all need to focus and go to a four-year school, they're off track. They're off track. You were talking, I remember my experience at Eastern. Um, I was always taught that everybody is equal. 
you know everyone is equal that was what I was taught at home that's what I was taught at church that's what I believe and back in the 60s and the 70s you know there was all the unrest with the, the Vietnam War and the civil rights and you know all that kind of thing and being from a little place like Clark County it was not very diverse in its population but whenever I went to Eastern I still tried to treat everybody with respect and with um, dignity and as a person I mean I didn't I didn't see color you know but I would it was kind of confusing at Eastern for somebody like me because I remember being in business ed and when um, you go into those majors, you see these same people over and over, you know, in your freshman level classes, you see them. And then as you get, go on through, and there was one particular girl, uh, her name was Rosalind and she was from the Chicago area and she was black, but she and I were paired up on a lot of different projects, um, throughout the time that we were there at Eastern. And I would consider Rosalind a, a good friend and she and I always worked well together and got along well and all that kind of thing when we were working on our projects in class. But when I would see her at the student union, or when I would see her, um, because she, John lived in Thomas and she lived in Andrews, which was the girls dorm that was next to Thomas. And I spent time at, at Thomas with John and we'd be in the, the lobby playing cards or whatever and Rosalind would walk through with her friends or the same with the student union. And I would say hello to her and she wouldn't say hello back. When she was with her friends, it was different than the relationship that we had when we were in class together. And that was always confusing to me because I was trying not to be a different person. I mean, I was trying to be the same person both times. And I don't know why she felt that she had to act differently when she was with her, her secular friends. I don't know. That was just always confusing to me. During your time in college, <clears throat> were you continue your involvement in things like music and other activities? What what were you involved with in the, um, outside of the classroom? Unfortunately, John and I were mainly suitcasers. That's what you know. We came home most weekends. Um, part of that was just because my sister Angie was still in high school then, so we'd come back and you know, see activities that she was involved in. John had a younger brother that was a year younger than him. So we'd come back and watch him play football. And, you know, Angie was in the band and watched that kind of thing. But part of it, we were just um, tied to the Marshall community. And we always went to church. I didn't start playing the piano regularly at church until, oh, I was probably 25 or 26 whenever Nina couldn't play anymore. Um, but we were still involved a lot in um, the church activities. And Jack Sims, Foster Probes, Angie, Beth, all of those people were younger than we were. And were, they were the main people that we ran around with and did a lot of things with, and they were still at home. But anyway, I was involved in uh, Pi Omega Pi at Eastern, that is the, the business education sorority, I guess, club. Um, but I won several awards with Pi Omega Pi. I was Pi Omega Pi Outstanding Freshman, and I was Pi Omega Pi Outstanding Senior, and I won the Business Education Alumni Award um, at the Honors Banquet. I was President of Pi Omega Pi, um, Secretary of Pi Omega Pi, you know, throughout my time there, that was just kind of the business ed club, and we did a lot of did a lot of things with that there. Have you kept in touch with any of that after graduation? Um, not as much. Some, I I have because of people that I teach with. You know, okay. you go through and um, with those different people in class, and then they teach in different places mm -hmm. than you do and so you'd see them at, at FBLA meetings or okay. um, you know sure. places like that but many of the people that uh, went through and got teaching degrees with me no longer teach you know Esther Sly doesn't teach anymore Karen Dollhan doesn't teach anymore you know they they've gotten out of they've gotten out of the profession particular reason do you think why 
part of it, they were kind of like me because um, after I graduated from Eastern, there wasn't a teaching position here at Marshall in Business. So I was the librarian at South School for three years, the elementary librarian at South School. Once again, back to love of reading and books and gotcha. all, of, all of that kind of thing. And then when John and I started to, or decided to start our family, then I quit teaching and was able to stay home with my kids. What year did you graduate from Eastern? Graduated from Eastern in May of 1974. Mm -hmm. And um, was at South School for three years, and then John and I started our family. And Well, now, you graduated, so that gave the blessing then for Dad to say okay yes. to the wedding? Yes, and John and I got married in okay. August of 1974. <laughs> okay. Yes. And... Uh, John, I was at South School, and John was at Hudsonville for two years. That's where he started his teaching career, and then he came to Marshall after two years and took Jim Lowe's place at the junior high science. And then we decided to start our family, and I went to work for Richard Eubank just two days a week. Once again, back to that secretarial yeah. skill. And so... Um, I was able, I felt, to have some time away and do some professional things, but also then stay home with my, with my kids. And when Heather went into kindergarten, um, I went to work for Richard full-time then. And when Heather went into sixth grade in August of 1992 was whenever I got the business position at Marshall High School. So with you, Banks, were you in a secretarial position or were you in the sales? Secretarial, Secretary. bookkeeper, that kind of thing. Richard kind of wanted me to be into sales, but I was <laughs> more the bookkeeper kind of thing. More that. So had you applied for teaching along the way at uh, Marshall High School? Not, not until, not until um, August, well, not until 1992. And I can't, I can't remember who left. Was it Rex Heine that left, whose position I took? Probably been about that time. Doris K. Gard. I think it was Rex Heine's position that I took, I believe. And that was fun to go back there because that was back with Sally Rector and uh, Chris Fitzgerald. Chris Fitzgerald uh, and I were classmates. She graduated in 1970 with me. And then Sally was Sally Douglas Rector. Sally was two years older than Chris and I, but Sally's sister Leslie and I had been good friends all throughout high school. Leslie was the one that wanted me to be the nurse with her. So going back to teach with Sally and Chris was wonderful because it was just, we all thought alike, we were all on the same page, you know, had the same goals and the same values. You know, we wanted, um, we had high standards, I guess is what I was, was trying to say. So it was great to teach with those people. And you were starting with business then, teaching yes, business. Yes, teaching yeah. business. Mm -hmm. yep. Was the curriculum pretty well set already, or did, were you kind of at liberty to change and it was develop pretty, that? It was pretty well set. Um, whenever I started, I did most of the keyboarding. And um, Chris liked the, yeah, typing. Um, they didn't change it until, the, that name keyboarding, until a little bit later. Um, Chris liked the accounting, so she taught most of the accounting classes, and Sally taught um, the upper level junior and senior classes in, oh, like WordPerfect and um, the more um, office machines, you know, that kind of thing. She taught those classes. So had computers become pretty well entrenched at that time? No, I didn't no, think so. they had not. They were just beginning. Okay. Um, so I was trying to think exactly when that really came in. And I, I had a, a big learning curve because I, had, I wasn't familiar with computers and uh, had to go back and learn how to do all of that. And uh, I did have one computer class that first year, uh, one course in computer applications, and I taught Microsoft Works and had to learn how to do all of that. Eastern was a big help in bringing me back up to speed and helped with that. I went back up and talked to them at the career counseling center there and they helped
put me in touch with people that could bring my skills up to date and all that kind of stuff. I did that even before I, you know, when I was interviewing so that I could talk the language and let them know that I was ready to, to go into this computer world because I really had just been uh, familiar with typewriters until then. I guess the problem is it keeps changing. It, it keeps changing. And then that's where I started out. But then once again, I said, this is technology driven. Um, when Ken Reed was principal there, he wanted to start a, a class called mm -hmm. desktop publishing. And um, he talked to me about teaching that and he wanted me to team teach it with Garnet Evola. And Garnet uh, was an English teacher, but she also had an art background. And she was really big into technology and was fearless about trying new <laughs> things like that. And, and um, so we really were, were good at team teaching. And then when that happened, um, then the curriculum kind of got flipped around and Sally went back to teaching more of the entry level keyboarding, although I had some of that. And I taught more of the junior and senior level uh, courses because the desktop publishing was more that and Ken was really interested in, in pushing that and developing that. And um, Garnet and I, you just get in on the, on the ground level of some of this kind of stuff, but um, Ken kind of saw that this is where things were going and we were one of the first schools that taught that. And um, so Garnet and I traveled many places. We put on conferences at Springfield and um, Charleston and Southern Illinois, you know, just presented many, many different places about the, the work that we were doing and how we were going about it here in Marshall High School. And uh, back then that was kind of cutting edge was. Cutting edge kind of thing. And that let other places know what's happening in Marshall uh -huh. and where uh -huh. Marshall is. Exactly. Exactly. And out of that, when we first started, um, we were not doing dual credit with Lakeland. Mm -hmm. But then that kind of developed. And so the desktop publishing classes that Garnet and I taught became dual credit. And I had gone back and gotten my master's in business. Um, the, the year that I started teaching in, in 1992, Eastern was offering uh, grad assistantships to um, people to get their master's in business and I applied for one of those and got that. So I got my master's in business which then qualified me. Uh, I met Lakeland's criteria because I had my master's in business to teach dual credit with them. So the desktop publishing classes that Garnet and I taught were dual credit. I taught business law through uh, Lakeland dual credit and all of that kind of thing. And I was one of the first dual credit teachers that Marshall High School had. You look back and you say, I might have done this a little differently or that. Do you ever think what you might have done differently? I, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. <laughs> And um, there are very few things. I, I really can't think of anything that I, would, that I would do differently. I probably would stay at Eastern and be more involved and not come home, not be the suitcaser, you know. But it wasn't that I wasn't involved because I was in that pile mega pie, mm -hmm. you know. But we just didn't get involved in that many of, like we didn't go to ball games at Eastern and... But Eastern wasn't really that good when we were there. <laughs> when we were there either, there wasn't that much to cheer for, you know. But I might get involved in more um, activities that way during college than what I did. Um, but not very many things that I would change about my life. You wouldn't think uh, maybe I made a mistake not going into nursing? No, 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 no. <laughs> Never questioned Never. that decision. Never questioned that one. With the, I guess, education, we talked about this earlier, it just keeps changing so much. Um, and now you have retired. You retired when? I retired in May of 2012, but I am, um, I had the, well, God just opens doors. He just opens doors. And because of that dual credit with Lakeland, Lakeland was familiar with yeah. my name. And um, the opportunity came for me to do some grant work. Um, with Lakeland, they were teaching some adult 
um, education classes where they were trying to get adults more te techno literate. And they contacted me, Linda Von Baron contacted me about teaching those classes. And because Linda was familiar with my name through dual credit and through 4-H, we haven't even talked about 4-H. Um, and then I got uh, hired to do uh, an HCCTP program, which that was through Lakeland. That was also grant work, but they were trying to um, bring students' skills up to date so that they would be ready for jobs in the trades. Okay. And um, I worked with Cindy Shoup on that, and she and I really got along well. And um, I did that for a semester, and then um, they called me to be a sub for the GED classes that were taught here in Marshall. Wow. And then um, the person that was teaching the GED classes didn't want to do it anymore, so now I'm the GED class teacher here at the Lakeland Center in Marshall, and I do that two nights a week, Monday and Wednesday nights. And that is, um, that, that's very different from being the dual credit and having the cream of the crop kids that are aiming for um, college, going back to teaching adults that have dropped out of school and, and know they've made a mistake and they, they want to go back and they want to get their education for a variety of reasons, but it's, it's very different. Do you find there's frustrations with that too? There's always there's always frustrations, but it's very rewarding because they yeah, exactly. they know that they have um, messed up and they they've taken that first big step to try to rectify a mistake that they made earlier, and they they really most of the students I'd say ninety percent of the students that I see really want to learn and really want to get that GED. There are some that are court ordered to be there, you know that That's that may not take it as as seriously. <clears throat> Um, some, so there's a, a little bit of frustration that way, but there's also frustrations where the system now doesn't take into account um, the skills that these, these have. There's one gentleman that I have, he's 47 years old. He never touched a computer until he walked into that classroom, but the state of Illinois says he has to take the test on a computer. So you're just kind of dooming these people to further failure because they won't let them take it with pencil and paper because he doesn't have any skills, you know. I don't know. That's a frustration. Maybe you can change that system. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Janet, you talked about things with teaching, retiring, Lakeland, but you haven't touched on your involvement with this place we're in now. The library. <laughs> the library. I love this library. Um, I've always loved libraries. I've loved reading. I loved Millie Frazier. She was the librarian whenever I was in grade school. And uh, whenever I was in school, I got to take books home to read. And when I graduated from college, there was no business position available. And I went to see Mr. Bush and just asked him if there were, what positions were available. And he looked at me and says, I need somebody for the library. So once again then, I had, Millie was my library teacher when I was in grade school, but then she became the person that I worked under at South School, because Millie was the head librarian. Always loved Millie. Um, then in 1987, I think, is that right? Or 85, one of those two years. <laughs> one of those two years. Um, <laughs> They asked me if I would be on the Marshall Public Library Board. And who was, who was one of the members of the Marshall Public Library Board at that time? Millie Frazier <laughs> was still was on the library board at that point. And um, I have been a member of the Marshall Public Library Board ever since for almost 30 years now. And seen it grow from um, the one building that we were in whenever we first started, that was the old Wilfong building, um, to expand to twice its size. We took in the old Kroger slash Western Auto building and seen all the changes that, w that accompanied that. We were able to help 
get a referendum passed that allowed uh, library services for the area surrounding district. Um, I was on the board when they hired the first library director, which was Nancy Claypool. And uh, she really took our library to the next level. Leanna Morris was the librarian whenever I first went on the board, and Leanna was a classmate of mine. She graduated in 1970 as well. Uh, and Leanna did a fantastic job. Leanna was like me. She always loved books. But, but there's only so much that one person can do, Ooh. you know, when you are the librarian. Um, you can't do a whole lot with writing grants and all that kind of thing and all that. But when Nancy got on board as director, um, she was able to write for more grants, but also she was able to, um, our programming just blossomed. And the, the way we could give back to the community with that cultural impact of that programming was just amazing. And she wrote for all kinds of exhibits to come here, Smithsonian exhibits and uh, exhibits from Tarbell Art Center and just fantastic things that we've been able to do for the community. Um, and when Nancy first started, she said she had to kind of try to contact people. But as Marshall's reputation grew and they became more familiar with Nancy, then those program ideas uh, came to her. We worked with the Humanities Council uh, for the state of Illinois and they brought many different programs here. And it, it's just been wonderful to see that bloom and the things that we've been able to offer to the community. For a town of 4,000, our yes. library is outstanding. It and is. The, the programs are so varied that we've mm -hmm. had here too. Mm -hmm. Marvelous. And, and well attended. And technology. We have computers <clears throat> here for public use and they've given classes on computers. We've tried to keep people literate in that regard. And now we've got wireless here where people can bring their own devices in and, and use things and the e-books and the, all that kind of stuff. It's a big... Uh, a big part of our circulation now is um, those technology related products. I read just a while back a new library was built and I recall somewhere in California. No books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this really the way the libraries are going to go? I, who, who can, I, I don't have a crystal ball, I can't see what the future is going to be, but you know. Um, it just doesn't seem like that ought to be. I, I still like to have that book in my hand. I've always been, um, the things I've been involved with have been involved with education. You know, teaching uh, children, I've taught Sunday school, you know, all that kind of thing, those mission organizations at church. Here at the library, it's education centered and, and also 4-H. Uh, I'm a big proponent of 4-H and I was in 4-H as a girl. I was in the Joliet's 4-H club and that was back in the day when there were still boys clubs and girls clubs, okay? Oh, that's right. You know, and that they, and I should say home ec clubs and ag clubs because there were girls that were in the ag clubs and had cattle and hogs and stuff like that. And there were, we had Joe Blagg was a member of our Joliet. So there were guys that crossed over and were in the home ec clubs as well. But the two were separate entities. And after I, um, I was in 4-H, I guess you can be in till you're eight till you're 19, turn 19. But then I became a leader with Jean Murphy when I was 21 and helped lead the Clarksville co-eds. And um, it was during this time that we got our first youth advisor here in Clark County and that person was Gail Stanley. And Gail Stanley had a hard row to hoe because things were changing in the area of 4-H as well as they were changing in everything else. And they, they wanted you to combine and not have home ec clubs and ag clubs. They just wanted you to have 4-H clubs. And that was a big deal here in Clark County. And there was a lot of resistance mm -hmm. to that. And one of the main reasons there was resistance was because it was the ag leaders that ran the 4-H barbecue and the ag leaders had the money and the home ec clubs didn't mm -hmm. have the money and there were some of those ag leaders that were very opposed mm -hmm. to combining and combining funds because they felt like that their it, it just wasn't fair and Gail Stanley was the one that had to weather storm. that storm and Gail wasn't here for too long. 
less than five years. And then she was replaced by Jan Harriet. Yeah. And um, by that time, though, things had, the, the yeah. things had been combined and, and uh, some of those leaders that were really opposed to the, to the joining had quit you know, and all that kind of thing, and, and things have moved forward ever since. But 4-H was one place where I felt like the whole county always just came together, you know. Mm -hmm. Being in a small county, there's always rivalries. There's always the Marshall-Casey rivalry where they don't get along, you know, because of athletic teams and stuff like that. But people always cooperated through 4-H. After they melded into that one, there was always cooperation there and, and and I always enjoyed that. I loved 4-H because I thought it taught people life skills, but it also taught them leadership skills. As a teacher, we could always tell the kids that had been in 4-H, yeah. because in 4-H you were expected to give talks and demonstrations, and you were on committees, and you had the chance to be an officer, and you could just see those leadership skills develop, you know. On interviews for our <coughs> Rotary Scholarships, mm -hmm. I can just usually tell. Yes. Who has been in 4-H? Yes. They just have that opportunity for community mm -hmm. service, the leadership opportunity that others Expressing don't. Expressing themselves. Exactly. Just, mm -hmm. It just stands out. Mm -hmm. The confidence is... Yeah. Be, and, and our daughter, Heather, was one of those. Holly, our older daughter, was never shy. And she never hesitated <laughs> to talk to anybody anytime. But Heather was very shy. And I was very shy as a child, too. So I could always, I, I was. And nobody can, can believe that <laughs> when they know me only as an adult. But I was very, very shy. So I could always sympathize with Heather. <laughs> but when she had to go up and give her first <clears throat> talk, her head was bowed. She didn't take her eyes off her notes. But then as time... <laughs> As time went on, you know, then she could look Broke people through. in the eye, and she, she really grew in that, and the confidence level grew in that, too. And she, um, I, she was a presidential scholar at Indiana State University, and she had to go through a series of interviews, you know, to get to that. And I always credit 4-H with giving her that confidence to go through something like that and express herself and, and to win that big award. You have mentioned your two daughters, Holly and mm -hmm. Heather. You might mention their last names now and where they lived and their spouses. Our, our oldest daughter is Holly Diane Haston Jarovsky. She got married to David Jarovsky in October of uh, 2003. And uh, they live in Lake in the Hills, Illinois, in the Chicago area. And I think Holly would like to come back to this area, but David is very much a Chicago, very much a Chicago person. And plus, he is an electrical engineer and his work. I mean, there's more opportunity for him to work up there. Holly is uh, has our two granddaughters. Abigail is nine, and Catherine, or Kate, is five right now. And um, our younger daughter is Heather Suzanne Haston Swan. She married Brian Swan just this past January in uh, 2015, and she lives in Terre Haute. Both of my girls are physical therapists, and they got that desire or that bug to be physical therapists because they were uh, football managers for their, da for their dad when he was coaching. And they saw the athletes get rehabbed and all that kind of stuff when they had injuries and they just were amazed at the progress of that and all that kind of thing. And so they got that interest in physical therapy from that. And um, Heather and Brian are expecting our third grandchild, which will be born in March of 2016 or April, depending on when he or she decides that they want to make their appearance. <laughs> With all of this and your interesting and very varied career, is there some individual person that has kind of influenced you more than anyone else? I mentioned Marilyn Smitley, and I'll mention Jean Murphy too. Jean Murphy and I were um, leaders in 4-H uh, together. And I was a shy person whenever I was growing up, very, very shy. And my mother was shy, and my mother was soft-spoken. Um, and Jean was not. <laughs> Jean was a take, Jean was a take charge kind of person. Um, and I, I love my mother, and I respect my mother, but I, I just always kind of wanted to be like Jean, where I could be a leader, you know? 
mother was not, mother never had that leadership ability uh, and never wanted it, never sought that out. Um, but Jean could, could organize things and, and lead things. And so I kind of modeled some of that after her and, and lost some of that shyness. Is there some world event that's taken place in your lifetime that really, uh, oh, it really had such an impact on you? Um, President Kennedy's assassination, I'll never forget that day. I was in sixth grade and um, in Mrs. Beale's classroom. And I remember Mr. Davis was the principal and he came in the classroom and whispered something in Mrs. Beale's ear and she started to cry. And um, then they turned on the TV. We had TVs in the classroom then and uh, turned it on and, and we started watching the events about how President Kennedy had been shot. And they, I think they let school out. I remember being home and watching the funeral um, at home. And it was just such a sad thing. I just never understood why. That is one of those tragic events. It seems yes. like everyone remembers it. Yes. And they remember where they were and what they were doing. Yeah. Just kind of amazing. And then the second one was 9-11. Um, and I was sitting in my classroom at Marshall High School and John, I think that was the first year that he was principal. And it was on my prep period because I was sitting there at my computer typing in lesson plans, I think, and he walked in the classroom. And I knew before he ever said anything that something was terribly, terribly wrong when I saw his face. And um, he told me what had happened with the Twin Towers. And, and uh, then it was kind of like with President Kennedy, you know, the, they had the TVs Ocean on in the, in the classrooms and in the library watching that. And I just remember that was kind of a loss of innocence on my part. And I know that I was older then, but America had been attacked on her home soil then. And that was, that was very hard. Um, to know that we were that vulnerable and all those people, you know, losing their lives and just the, the senselessness of it all. I just, I can't wrap my head around it. And we still, I think, are kind of shaken by it. We right. stop thinking about what really happened, right. how many lives were lost. Right. One question that I ask just about everyone when we kind of begin to wrap up is, if you were traveling somewhere else, and I know you certainly have, and you say, I'm from Marshall, Illinois, they say, where is that? What's that all about? What would you tell them about Marshall? Why it might be a good place to visit? Oh, we have this conversation frequently. <laughs> um, we, I usually ended up telling them about the farm and how corn and soybeans is pretty to me, you know. Um, just the greenness of the landscape. And I love how uh, I live in a place where there's four seasons and the, the seasons change. I love the different changing seasons. I love Marshall because it is just such a, it's just home. And the people here are so warm and friendly and welcoming and they truly um, want to help. You know, when there's a need in our community, people come together to try to meet that need. And I don't know that those of us that have grown up in Marshall and, and consider this normal really understand what a special place we live in. And I got a little glimpse of that that first year that I was teaching because I had only been associated with, with the Marshall school system. You know, I, mm -hmm. I went to school in Marshall. I, I did student teach in Paris for that one semester. And then I taught at South School for those three years. Um, and then mother had taught at Martinsville, you know, but I wasn't really in with the administration of that. But I went back and got my master's. And that was the summer after I had taught my first full year of school. And in that room, there were business teachers from all over the area, Edwards County, you know, Charleston, all over the area. And we sat there and we talked about different issues and different things that came up and they were talking about how things were handled in their district and the comparison to be between how they were handled at Marshall. It was just, there was just no comparison. You know what I'm saying? That, um, and part of that is the administration that we had at that time, Russ Ross, you know, was just great in what he did. But part of that also was just the Marshall community and the way they handled things. And I've seen the same thing 
in the library. Um, I've been on Marshall Library Board for almost 30 years, but I also had the opportunity to serve on the Lincoln Trail Library System Board and then was elected to the uh, Illinois Heartland Library System Board and have dealt with libraries from all over the southern part of the state of Illinois and the way the Marshall community supports their library and the way they pull together, it is just not like that in other places. And so what we consider normal here, if you've just grown up here, Marshall is so, is just such a step above in their community service activities and things that other communities are. Sometimes you hit on the fact they really may not appreciate it as much as if you've gone out. Right. And a lot of people, we're one of them, mm -hmm. lived away from here for a number of years. You mentioned your daughter. Uh, come find out Marshall's not such a bad place to live no, after all. No, not it's at all. a lot of advantages. And you see that in people that have been away and then move, mm -hmm. move back here. And they will tell you the same yeah. thing that um, it's a pretty special place, but those of us that have never left here, I don't think often get that picture sometimes. We just think this is what normal is, and it's really not. <laughs> really not. It's just been a delight visiting with you. I sure appreciate your time. And you started out with the name Clab. Yes. And I'm going to kind of go back, way back around the circle. I had a wonderful privilege of knowing and meeting a gentleman named Charlie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love music and just uh, so vivacious and outgoing. Uh huh. What can you say about Mr. Charlie Clapp? Charlie, I remember he is a distant relative, not a close relative. I wasn't he's sure how close. He's from another branch, but Charlie would. Um, I associate Charlie with Kirchners, mm -hmm. okay, because he worked there lots. I associate Charlie with Rotary, because he was a great That's Rotarian. Where I have yes, and there were times that Charlie would come out to Clarksville Church, but not, not a whole lot. Charlie was a half-brother to Wes Hogue. Yeah, I guess that's right. And um, so I would see him occasionally with Wes and Nina, okay? Um, Charlie could tell wonderful stories. He was a great, great storyteller. Yes. And whenever I picture Charlie, I picture him in, he kind of had a tan color suit that was maybe his best suit or something, but whenever I would see Charlie, he would have that, unless I saw him at Kirchner's, he would have that, um, that brown suit on for special occasions. But he was, a, he was a wonderful man. And I understand he had a huckster wagon for a number of years too. Now, I, I'm not familiar with. Because he had told me some stories one time about it, huckster days. Uh -huh. It was fascinating, as you uh -huh. say. Uh -huh. Like he had a story for every occasion. That's how he got his start, though, was with that huckster mm -hmm. wagon, wasn't it? I think so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenna, I want to say again a big thank you so much for taking your time out of your schedule, busy day, to be with us. We really appreciate you participating in the Oral History Project. And this is not for today, tomorrow but it goes in the file and will be available for people to listen to in the future. Which I think is a wonderful thing and it's another wonderful uh, aspect of what our library does. Exactly. Okay, We are interested in preserving that martial history. And we're so fortunate to have someone like you who's been on the board for so long and such a devoted interest to moving our library forward. Well, we really appreciate that. Well, it's worth it, you know. <laughs> I believe I believe in the Marshall Public Library. I believe in the Marshall community. You know, I just think we're a special place, and I'm well, glad to be a part of it. <laughs> certainly obvious that you do, and your husband and you have both been really an integral part of our uh, of our community, and we're so glad to have that uh, that kind of support. Well, thank you. And thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you.